Welcome to FilmmakerIQ.com. Today we dive into the seedy underbelly of film noir. Film noir. It's a term coined by French film critic Nino Frank in 1946, which literally means black film. But defining what makes a film film noir, well, that isn't so easy. The stereotypical film noir features a fedora sporting gumshoe and a femme fatale being chased in an urban landscape. But there are many noirs that don't have private eyes or killer dames and take place in the suburbs. Unlike gangster films, there are no character requirements for noir, nor is there a location requirement as in westerns. No far-fetched science fiction, no song and dances and musicals, and certainly no superheroes with magic powers. So without a rigid definition, noir may be best described as a feeling through visual styling of low-key lighting and story conventions. Since there is so little to define film noir, understanding it requires us to look at noir in the context of history and technology. We'll pick up the story in the 1930s, the Great Depression era in American history. Building on the advancements of filmmaking in the 1920s that added sound, better black and white photography, and smaller, more controllable lighting, the big five Hollywood studios were busy honing their production and distribution methods. This was a boom time for film. And going to the movies was a way for an economically depressed country to escape their troubles. And by 1939, there were 15,000 movie theaters in the United States, more than the number of banks. The 30s was also the beginning of Technicolor in motion pictures, bringing beautiful color to blockbuster films like Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. But the technology of color was still relatively young, and the three-strip color process required massive amounts of lighting. These epics were expensive and took a long time to make. Now, rather than sinking all their eggs into the financial success of a few big spectacles, the studios used block booking, a system which was perfected by Adolf Zucker at Paramount during the silent era. And here's how block booking works. In order for independent theater operators to get the rights to show a big A-list film, they would have to buy blocks of films from the studio, which included A-list films, as well as a mix of less desirable B-list films, often shown at the bottom of a double feature. At the height of the studio era, these blocks could include up to 100 films, a complete year's worth of programming, purchased blindly by the theaters before the films even went into production. So by leveraging the power over A-list movies, the studio was able to guarantee a profit on the B-movies because they were being charged at a flat rate. The more B-movies they make, regardless of the quality, the more money they could make, so long as they kept their costs down. So in order to do this, they needed to make a lot of movies and tell a lot of stories. They turned to gangster films, western, sci-fi, horror, and of course, pulp fiction crime stories, which would serve the basis for many film noir. Even though quality wasn't the top priority for executives, no filmmaker sets out to make a bad film. And because of the financial success was relatively insured, a certain level of experimentation was allowed in the studio. So through this low-budget studio filmmaking, the film noir style emerged, especially in the crime genre, based greatly on German expressionism brought over by artists who were escaping Nazi threat in Europe and pursuing a career in Hollywood. That Nazi threat would materialize in the Second World War. The carnage of the war left many people feeling disillusioned and numb, a common theme in film noir. The war also advanced filmmaking technique as many cinematographers returning to Hollywood had served in the military as documentary filmmakers. They had faster and more light-sensitive film, better and more compact instruments, and these new cinematographers weren't afraid of shooting on real locations, all these contributing to the look and feel of film noir. Now, these filmmakers were dealing with some serious issues of murder, sex, and crime but they were bound by the Motion Picture Production Code, commonly called the Hayes Code, which censored taboo subjects. This forced filmmakers to be more suggestive rather than explicit in their filmmaking, hiding the ugly business in the shadows of the scene. So you had all these forces that culminated into the classic era of film noir. Studios padding their blocks with low-budget B-films, 
low-key lighting greatly influenced by German Expressionism. Characters with a sense of nihilism caused by the lead up to and the aftermath of World War II and a restrictive production code. But as with anything, the world keeps changing and this era would come to an end. In 1948, the Supreme Court of the United States put an end to block booking. In the court decision, United States versus Paramount Pictures Incorporated et al. using the Sherman Antitrust Act. The studios immediately cut back on the number of B-movies produced as their distribution methods had to change. How B-movies were made and their audiences would change along with it. Now, many filmmakers were laid off, but they found work in a new medium, television. Television kept audiences at home and away from the movie theaters and established a new visual style. I Love Lucy, which used a lighting setup devised by Carl Frund of Metropolis fame, eliminated shadows on a set so that footage from a live multi-camera production could be cut together seamlessly. This flat, even lighting look created for technical purposes, ironically by one of the great cinematographers from the German Expressionist era, was a stark contrast to the moodiness of noir lighting. And it became a stylistic norm copied on television shows over and over again, and even to this day. Now, film continued to battle television for audiences, introducing things like widescreen aspect ratios, higher budgets, and more risque content, which ultimately led to the abandonment of the Hays Code by the late 1960s. In terms of film technology, color film continued to advance. So by the end of the 50s, color film was becoming much more practical on set. The technique of using harsh backlighting in film noir to create separation in black and white wasn't as necessary, as the differences in color could easily provide that same sense of distance inside color productions. There's no better way to get a sense of film noir than to look at a few defining films of the classic era. Let's start with what many consider is the first true noir film. The Stranger on the Third Floor, from 1940. Directed by Boris Inkster, written by Frank Partos and Nathaniel West, and lensed by Nicholas Musuraka, Stranger on the Third Floor tells the story of a newspaper reporter whose court testimony was used to convict a murder suspect. But he's having doubts about the conviction, especially after he finds his neighbor dead under similar circumstances. Musuraka's visual style in this B-film would define the look of film noir. Especially notable is the brilliant German Expressionist inspired dream sequence as the reporter imagines his own false conviction. I'm telling you, I didn't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, you're the jury. Please believe me, I'm innocent. There was a man in the hall, a stranger. He. Why aren't you listening to me? Make them hear me. They've got to. The defendant will refrain. I didn't kill him. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You can't convict me. You can't. I didn't kill him. I didn't. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes. yes. But I'm not guilty. The stranger killed him. There. There he is. Another essential film noir is Double Indemnity, directed by Billy Wilder in 1944. Photographed by John F. Seitz and written by Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler, Double Indemnity tells the story of an insurance salesman involved in a murder plot on his lover's husband. Though certainly not a B-movie by any stretch of the imagination, both Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck were A-list celebrities, you can see a lot of the elements of film noir coming into play as Billy Wilder brought his German Expressionism influences to Seitz's cinematography. Hello, baby. Anybody else in the house? Nobody, why? What's that music? Radio up the street. Just like the first time I came here, isn't it? We were talking about automobile insurance. Only you were thinking about murder. I was thinking about that anklet. And what are you thinking about now? 
Moving into the 50s is Joseph Lewis's The Big Combo, released in 1955. Written by Philip Jordan and photographed by John Alton, The Big Combo was a low-budget B-picture that defied many of the taboos of the time, including violence, sex, and homosexual characters. It tells the story of a police lieutenant Diamond's unwavering pursuit of a sadistic crime boss named Mr. Brown. Extremely controversial at the time was a suggestive scene where Mr. Brown demonstrates his mastery over his girlfriend, Susan. Susan, tell me, come on. What's bothering you? I hate and despise you. Susan, what are you trying to do? Drive me bats? What do you want, Susan? Tell me. I'll give you anything you want. Tell me. Nothing. Anything at all. Nothing. Nothing. No. Nothing. Coming in at the tail end of the classic film noir period is Orson Welles' 1958 film, Touch of Evil. Cinematography by Russell Meddy and written by Orson Welles, Touch of Evil takes place in a small border town where a car bomb has killed a prominent building contractor. Mexican narcotics officer Mike Vargas, played by Charlton Heston, is visiting on his honeymoon and he gets entangled with an investigation led by a crooked cop, Captain Hank Quinlan, played by Orson Welles. Even though the forces that created the elements of film noir may have changed, like a certain style of music, film noir will never completely go away. After the classic era, noir elements would find their way into all genres and budgets, an endless well that filmmakers continue to draw from. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. It seems you feel our work is not a benefit to the public. Replicants are like any other machine. They're either a benefit or a hazard. If they're a benefit, it's not my problem. May I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? Aren't you? Frightened. That's all right. I can help you. Who is this? I am a doctor. Now you must listen to me. You have lost your memory. There was an experiment. Something went wrong. Your memory was erased. Do you understand me? No, I don't understand. What the hell is going on here? Just listen. There are people coming for you, even as we speak. You must not let them find you. You must leave now. Hello? Are you there? No! I banda! There is no band. Il n'est pas de orchestra. This is all a tape recording. No, I banda, and yet we hear a band. If we want to hear a clarinet. They got this guy in Germany 
Fritz something or other. Or is it? Maybe it's Werner. Anyway, he's got this theory. You want to test something, you know, scientifically. How the planets go around the sun, what sunspots are made of, why the water comes out of the tap. Well, you got to look at it. But sometimes you look at it. Your looking changes it. You can't know the reality of what happened or what would have happened if you hadn't have stuck in your own goddamn schnoz. Please. Excuse me, miss. I was wondering if you could help me. I'm looking for somebody. Cold night like this, everybody's looking for somebody stranger. It's not like that. My name is Nancy. Eyes to the stage, Pilgrim. She's just a woman. I took Gotham's white knight and I brought him down to our level. It wasn't hard. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> We've only just begun to scratch the surface of everything that is film noir. It's a massive and important style made possible by compact lighting technology, faster film, German expressionism, the studio system's appetite for low budget films, and that part in each of us that loves a dark, dark story. It's all connected, every bit of it, contributing to the well of our shared past and understanding. So use it. Let it inform your filmmaking. Go out and make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.